Is heaven perfect? Yeah. It's perfect. Uh, you've never been there. How do you know it's perfect? You haven't been there. Our God, God says it was perfect. Is it perfect even if we don't believe it's perfect? Is, if, is it still perfect even if we don't get to go? It's still perfect. Is Jesus Christ God in the flesh? Is he still God in the flesh if we don't believe he's God in the flesh? So he's God in the flesh if we don't even know he was God in the flesh. He's still truth never changes. Truth is still truth. And so is Jesus Christ perfect? He's perfect even though we may not know that he was perfect. I didn't know even know about him. For years I never knew about Jesus. Now you take the Bible. You got God the Father, you got God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you got the Bible. Now the Bible is the Bible perfect. The Word of God that God gave, original, was it given to us perfectly? Yes. But then the Word of God must be perfect. Is the Word of God perfect if we don't believe it's perfect? Yes. Is the Word of God perfect if we never get a copy of it? Yes. So it's possible that we could have a perfect Word of God but not possess it in our hands. That's possible. There's people in this world that have no copies of the Scriptures. Does that mean that the Word of God doesn't exist because they don't have a copy? No, it still exists. It's still good. It's still perfect. Because that's how God says He would preserve His Word. And His Word has been preserved. But can man, can man add to the Word of God, take away from the Word of God, and corrupt the Word of God? Now, we have a lot of versions that are corrupt versions. So, it's still the Word of God, but there's people who corrupt the Word of God. Now, just because people corrupt the Word of God, that means that we don't have the good Word of God anymore. We still have the Word of God. Whether it's in the original that God had when He first gave it, and I believe that He has a good copy up in heaven. Everything has been preserved. I believe whether it's the Hebrew or the Greek, we still got that. It's translations that sometimes we have a problem with. I do not believe that the men that God used to, you know, give us a King James Version, I don't believe they were inspired of God. I don't believe in double inspiration. I believe they were translators. That's all. They were translators. Uh, it wasn't given to them by the Holy Spirit guiding each one of those men that wrote the King James. I don't believe that. Of course, I get accused of a lot of things, but that's okay. But I do want you to see and understand this. Out of all the books in the world, this book, the Bible, is the only inspired book in the world. There is not another book that can compare with this book. Now, in the beginning, when God took the dust of the ground and he formed a body, and the Bible says, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a, a living soul. So man became a living soul because God breathed life into him. When we study the Bible, remember this, the Bible, it says it's God-breathed. Inspiration, it's God-breathed. means God didn't just have a book written. Otherwise, it would be just like a history book, a biology book, a chemistry book, or some other book. God breathed into this book. This book is alive. This book can give life. This book is as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Anybody can quote that verse? The For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two What does it mean to be quick? Alive. Now, either it is or it's not. God breathed, God breathed life into this book. This is a living book. It can give you life. I want you to take your Bible and look in the book of um, John chapter 6 real quick with me. I may get to the notes, may not, it don't matter. But I want you to look here in John chapter 6. And notice what he says. Verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Get this now. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? His word is life. This is God breathed, I meaning God has breathed life into his word. That's why when you read this book, you can get life from this book. Uh, take your Bible, uh, Bible and just look over it very quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2. 
Make it chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to see a verse there. In verse 23 of 1 Peter chapter 1, as he talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the what? Then if you're born by the word of God, then the word of God must have life in these seeds. The word of God is life. Sometimes we think it's, well, it's just another book. When you approach this book, this is God's book. This is divinely inspired. And that's why it's so important. And it's written by, most people say, between 35 and 40 people over a period of 15 to 1600 years. And I believe that. It has historical, scientific, and prophetic accuracy. It doesn't necessarily look upon it as a, a medical book, but when it touches on it, it's going to be accurate. When it touches upon history, it's going to be accurate. And when it touches upon prophecy, it's accurate. The Word of God can be trusted. And another thing is the Word of God is so simple and easy to understand once you've been saved and you have the Holy Spirit in dwelling you. And a lot of the scriptures is sermons and stories, illustrations, it holds your interest. There is no book like this book. And if there's anything you and I need to do, it is to fall in love with this book. And so whenever you want to talk to the Lord, and you don't know exactly what to say, just start reading the Bible and let him talk to you. And it's amazing how much easier it is to talk to him after you let him talk to you. And you let the Lord talk to you through his word. But you need to approach the Bible as this is the infallible word of God. Inerrancy, infallibility. Inerrant means it cannot err. And infallible means it cannot fall. It means it, ha it can't fail. Whatever it says, it has to be true. Whatever it prophesies, it has to be true. There is no mistakes in God's word. But I want you to look there in your notes. Under the little section, that uh, definition of revelation. Because God is infinite. It means God has no limit. Now we can study about a love of God. And as it says that in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. About studying about the love of God. But you know, you can't come to the depths of all of it. Or the heights of all of it. And yet it tells us to study. There is no understanding total that we can understand with our finite mind means that we're limited we're limited in everything that we can do and what we have and what we can be we're limited but he is infinite it means there's no limit on his wisdom there's no limit on his power no limit on his understanding and power and love and there, there's no limit to it but you and i will never with a finite mind ever grasp it now, we've said this before, when you talk about how God has revealed things to us, the world, the world, and the word, the word, and the world, these two things, if God made the world and God gave us his word, then they both have to be in harmony with each other. It means that they're both here for a reason. The world, something that we can see and touch and feel, but the world is how we know that there's a God without the word. We know that there's a God by the power of reason. This book is revealed to us. This is by revelation. Reason, revelation. The world, the word. So God has given to us a way that man can know God. Now, with the world alone, man may know that there is a God, but he doesn't know how to explain who God is, how God did anything, what this is all about, why he's here, where he came from, what he's doing, where he's going. He has no answer, so he has to make it up in the vain imagination. But this book is given to us so that we can know. And he talks about, and the eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Yea, the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Because 
No man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God which is in him. No man knows the things of another man. But if he could have his Spirit come within us, then we'd know everything about that man. So God gave us his Spirit so we can know the things that are of God. Because the things of God are spiritually discerned. And without the Holy Spirit, you cannot discern them. So God has blessed us and given, given us his word. And you'll notice in that verse when he says, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth. What lives? Which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God is alive. Because he, when Christ came into the word, he was the greatest manifestation of the revelation there is of God. Old Testament prophets may have come, but he says, in these last days has spoken unto us by his Son. And no one represented God the Father like God the Son. So whenever you saw the one, you saw the other. You're talking about a chip off the old block. I, hate, I should have said it that way. But he's, he is a picture of the Father and Son. That's why he said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So I believe that that is the way it is. Anyway, uh, the general revelation. There's the general revelation, which is what God does by the creation of the world and what he can see in the heavens and stars and all the stuff. Those are things that is a general revelation. And you'll notice there, general revelation means that God has shown himself to all men at all time and all places. Special revelation, it means that he has shown himself through the word and through the son. So Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, well, the Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he also says that he came into the world, and his own received him not. But then he says in verse 14, can anybody quote John 1:14? And the word became, and, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Very good. So he came into the world. He was the word revealed. And the reason, because God wants us to know him. Now, you can't see God. You can only see his tracks. I know somebody's been through here. There's his tracks. That's what one aunt said to the other aunt when he was sitting on the train tracks. I know there's a train. I see his tracks. But anyway, I'll get to that after a while. The special revelation. Look at letter B. By this is meant that God has revealed himself through the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. And his word, the Bible. The work of Christ was to reveal the Father and his word, the Bible. Secondly, Christ came to bring salvation to mankind. Now get this statement, as a man, Jesus Christ was the most complete revelation of God because he was God. So when we talk about, I want to know God, then you'll have to study the Son. And if you'll study the Son, you'll learn about God. Because Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh. This definition of inspiration uh, you heard me mention this before, and I think I brought out here uh, a three or four different kinds of vessels, you know, and there were different shapes of vessels. And so the vessels represent the prophets. But remember, the mold is theirs. The gold is his. The mold is theirs. The gold is his. And if I took pure gold and I poured it into each one of these different kinds of different shaped vessels, the gold is still just as pure. It may have a different shape to it, but it's still gold. And when you talk about how God was able to take a man, and yet at the same time, pure gold, and yet it can have the characteristics of an individual. Because it's got to the place where I can read Paul's writings and I can see Paul. I can sense Paul. It's like when I read the other book, this is Paul. This is Paul. And I'll be honest with you, when I read the book of Hebrews, I see Paul all over the place, but I can't prove it. But I believe that Paul was used of God to write it. But I don't have to be right. It doesn't matter. It's still divine. So pure gold, the word of God, into the people, and this is what happens. So take your Bible, and you're right there in the book of First Peter. 
And I want you just to see this real quick. First Peter, in chapter 1, they didn't always understand everything that was happening or what they even wrote. See there in verse 10 of chapter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Means in the Old Testament, the prophets when they wrote talked about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. But they had difficulty discerning how can this be? And is it going to be two comings or not? They didn't see but one coming and they had difficulty understanding. So they searched it diligently, seeking to understand what the scriptures meant. Now for you and I, oh, we don't have no problem with that. If they'd have come and asked me, I could have told them, hey, it's, it's two comings. But wait a minute, that was be, that, that's now. But before the cross, they saw one. But they saw the sufferings, and they saw the glory. And that's why it was hard for them to understand the Messiah is supposed to come as a lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, the white horse and deliver them from the iron heel of Rome. And he comes meek and lowly, riding on a, a donkey. You know, it's not the same picture. And so things did happen. But I want you to also look at another scripture with me. Because I believe that it's uh, important. Look there in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter had gone with the Lord. And several others up on the top of the mount, they called it the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was transfigured right in front of them. And he showed them his power and his glory. When they said they looked upon him that was brighter than the noonday sun, his raiments were glowing white. And then he says here, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. See there in verse 16? We were eyewitnesses. We saw him. We saw him in his majesty. And then he made the statement in verse 17, For he himself, or he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this verse, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No verse, one verse, stands alone. The scripture must perfectly dovetail. And he says, we saw him, we heard him but we have something that's better than that we have a more sure word of prophecy the word of God that we have how would you like to be Abraham and he talked to you one day and then he didn't show up for another 15 years now what did he really say I, I think he said but I'm not sure what he said oh so long ago we can take the word of God and read it how often Every day. And this word that we have here is just as good and true and real as what he said when he was talking to Moses. Or when he told Abraham what to do. When he told David what to do. All these, they had nothing on us. They had portions. We've got the complete word of God. And we ought to treasure it and be so thankful for it. The day may come where they may confiscate our Bibles. Did you know that it's to your advantage and my advantage if we would commit as much scripture to memory as possible? We may wish that we had. If we'd have just remembered a little bit more, studied a little bit harder. Wouldn't it be a shame to get to heaven and Ruth walked up to you and said, Hey, my name is Ruth. Yay, glad to meet you. Did you read my book? Huh? Well, you know, I was so busy, I didn't have time. Oh, there's Ezekiel over there. Ezekiel walks up to you and says, hey, did, did you read my... Well, you know, you got me bogged down in all this temple talk stuff. I just couldn't follow it. I mean, I just got... I just got... I, I couldn't follow it at all. 
Oh, what about Isaiah? Yeah, it was too long. Isaiah, you, you started off good, but it got so long. You know, like how, you know how many chapters you got in that book? And you'd be surprised. Now, you don't want to hurt their feelings when you get up there, do you? Because the Bible says in the Matthew chapter 8, he says, in the kingdom, he says, they'll come from the east and the west, and we will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just think, we're going to sit down with them. You're going to see them. What are you going to talk about? You know, I, I just didn't have time. You know, I was so busy. I'm sure they'll be impressed. You didn't have time for the Word of God. But anyway, what I want you to see also down here in verse 20. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, I don't get to interpret it my way, and you don't get to interpret your way. Not one verse stands alone. All of it works together. And he also says this in the next verse. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man. In other words, a man didn't sit down and say, you know, I got a thought. Boy, I thought this would make, I think I'll write me a Bible. I think I'll write me a book. And isn't it amazing? You can take all these books and you put them in here and they all agree. They don't, they, 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 there's no contradictions. There's no conflicts. Everything perfectly dovetails. And there's a theme that runs through the whole Bible. And that theme is Jesus Christ himself. It's about the Lord. It's always about the Lord. And he says here, Holy men of God, as they were moved or guided along by the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit guided these people. And the Lord knew what they knew. The Lord knew their style. They, the Lord knows all. Of, and God can use a man but the goal was his. The truth was his. And how it was shaped, nothing of the word of God has ever been lost. So God is able to preserve his word the way he wanted it. And I believe we have got in our hands a copy of the word of God. The Bible does not contain the word of God. But what? It is the word of God. So... If you will, I uh, want you to look at a, a few verses, uh, only because uh, it makes so much sense if you just see these verses and what they say. Look here in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and you'll notice in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It's one of the, that's in your notes right there, and you'll see this, all scripture, all scripture. I wonder if that would include the Old Testament. All scripture. Would that include the New Testament? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all God breathed. It means God has breathed life into his word. When you believe what God's word says, it gives you life. When you can believe what he says, and by faith, faith comes alive. That's what gives you action. That's what causes you to want to do something. Because the Word of God can change you and motivate you, do things for you. We limit God by our own limited thinking when we don't believe what He says. <coughs> All Scripture given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, what's right, for reproof, what's wrong, for correction, how to make it right, for instruction, and how to teach it right in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, Truly furnished unto all good work. In other words, the word of God is sufficient to give every person exactly what they need to do the work that God wants them to do. This book. You know I, a thing that I noticed when I was going through some notes and thinking about this? The Bible never sends me to somebody else's writings. God's word never sends me to somebody else's word for authority. Now, you know, when a lot of preachers preach, they bring up a whole list of people from eons past, you know, as proof that this is true because Dr. John R. I. says, Curtis Hudson says, Dr. Lee Robertson says, uh, Dr. Cameron says, Ray Stanford says, Hank Lindstrom says, but I got news for you. They're not the authority. Neither is Yankee Arnold, neither is Bob Brooks, Bob Gilbert, Peter, our, our motto, we're not the authority. There's one authority, this book. It's 
So very seldom do I ever refer to other people to try to prove my point because they're not the authority. This is the authority. If this isn't, if this isn't it, <laughs> then I don't have anything else to stand on. The Bible doesn't tell me to read and study some book that was written by some other man. Have you ever thought about that? I didn't think about that until today. I thought about that. I said, that's a good point. No, why in the world did it take me so long to learn something that's so simple? Look on the back part of the page, back of the page. The top of the page, doctrine taught in the Bible have unquestionable authority over the believer. Do you believe that? If this is the Word of God, there is doctrine that's taught in the New Testament. Doctrine, Bible doctrine, is like the bone structure of your flesh. What would you be able to do if you did not have any bones in your body? Have you thought about it? You would be one big blob laying on the floor. You couldn't talk. You couldn't walk. You couldn't do anything. What? Because you, you don't have any bones. Now, Bible doctrine is the bone structure for every Christian. Because Bible doctrine is when you study the Bible, you know where to hang the meat. You've got to know where to hang the meat. Where does it belong? Or you're going to put an ear on the end of your elbow. It doesn't go there. But when you study Bible doctrine, sound words, and sound doctrine produces a sound mind. And that's in the book of Timothy in chapter 1 where he talks about, He hath not given unto us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, power, and a sound mind. So this is why this is so important. So you need to know Bible doctrine. The words here, uh, inerrancy and infallibility, means that the scriptures are free from all error, inerrancy, infallible, can't fail, can be said to be two sides of the same coin. Now, look at this, and we won't have time to cover all of this because I get more than I can cover. But you got some notes that you can read and look at later if you want to. But the witness of Christ... The Lord Jesus believed in and taught the inerrancy of the Old Testament. When he was here, you'll find that he kept continually quoting the Old Testament. And he talked about the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, that means that whatever's in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, he put his stamp of approval upon those scriptures. And so he makes this statement in Matthew 15. Here states... Christ states clearly that he had not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. If there were error in them, he could not say he came to fulfill them. Not totally. But he came to totally fulfill the law. And he refers to the Old Testament. Especially the first five books of the Bible. Especially like Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy is one that the higher critics like to say, well, it is not, it's not real. It, it wasn't really, you know, inspired of God. And there's a difference about who, uh, you know, really wrote some of these books and so forth. Yeah, I know. But whenever you read that, I want you to take your Bible and look there in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 8. Go all the way back there to Deuteronomy in chapter 8. Now, you remember when Jesus was at the temptation of Christ, when the devil was trying to get at him, remember, chapter 3 of the book of uh, Matthew, uh, it says that he was baptized by John the Baptist, and the dove came upon him, and then the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and then it says in chapter 4 and verse 1, and the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Forty days. So he was up there for quite a while. And so he was very hungry. And so he was tempted. Now look what he says here by the devil. In Deuteronomy in chapter 8, I'll be there in a minute, chapter 8, I want you to look in verse 3. In verse 3 says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, 
that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Who said this? Jesus said this, and who did he say it to? He said it to the devil. Jesus must have known the book of Deuteronomy. Do you think he had an understanding of the book of Deuteronomy? Isn't that one of the first five books of the Bible that's supposed to be written by Moses? And he's saying, it's true. And he quotes it. And also, look there in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Look in chapter 6. Chapter 6, look in verse 16. Remember, the Bible teaches that God is a jealous God. And the way that you tempt the Lord is by trying to make God jealous. Jealousy is the fear of being replaced. And God doesn't want to be replaced by anything. All right, here you are, and here's God. Don't put anything between you and God. Why? Because God is a jealous God. He doesn't want you to love anything more than Him. So he can move it away. I'm just saying. Don't play games with God. Don't tempt the Lord thy God. Don't jump off the Empire State Building and say, well, so far so good. If God doesn't want me to die, I won't die. You're nuts. You have an appointment with the concrete. But notice what he says here in verse 16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, that's just one little line. And yet, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes that one little line. It must be important. Every word. You see, it wasn't just the food that he ate. He lived by the book. Lived by the book. You and I, it's not just, a, I want to put food into my body so I can live. I got to live by the book. This is the book. This is the Word of God. This is God's love letter to His children. It should be important to us. We should have a great appreciation for this book. You may have to find time to read the Word of God. Sometimes you have to make time. There's always so much pressure upon our time that sometimes the most important things in all the world if I'm not to live by bread alone, but by every word that liveth cometh out of the mouth of God, then if this is why I'm supposed to be alive, this is what I'm supposed to be living for, then maybe I need to find out something to, you know, keep me alive. The word of God is alive. It gives a vision. It gives hope. That's what builds your faith. And if you will, well, as they say, if you'll, Believe and strengthen your faith that your doubts will starve to death. But if you feed your doubts, then your faith will starve to death. Look also in chapter 10, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, look in verse 20. Verse 20. He makes a statement, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Did you know that's what he told the devil? He offered him the kingdoms of the world. All he wanted was, just bow down and worship me. He said, can't do that. Can't do it. Not going there. So, if Jesus says that the Old Testament is true, I believe it's true. And if he says uh, the law, the prophets, and the psalms, and he considers all of it, I think it is. I would believe it too. Uh, look at the uh, thing down here where we have uh, Lot's wife. These are certain illustrations where people question whether or not this really happened. You know that story about the Sodom and Gomorrah? You know all those, the, uh, the homosexuals and so forth? Uh, that never really happened. That, it didn't really happen. It's just a story to scare people. Uh -huh. Jesus says it was real. And he's referring to back there in the book of Genesis. So he went from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy. 
put a stamp of approval upon those books. And he also says this. When he says, remember Lot's wife. That's what that scripture in Luke 17 is talking about. Remember Lot's wife. And what happened to Lot's wife? Why, when she turned into a pillar of salt? Jesus says that was true. He says that happened. Well, in that same chapter in Genesis, it also says the reason why that place went up in smoke. Because of their sinful, wicked deeds. Because it was an abomination. Men with men, women with women. God said this. Jesus said this. I've had people say, well, you know, Jesus never said anything about the, the homosexuals. Well, well, I would think this has something to do with it. Wouldn't you think this has something to do with it? That it was ex exploded, went up in fire? It, it also talks about this in Matthew when he talks about in comparison and judgment and so forth. They would have remained to this day if they'd have had somebody there that would have done the job. Lot was there, but he vexed his righteous soul from day into day with their unlawful because of what he saw and what he heard. And that's the same thing as pornography is seeing and hearing their law, unlawful wicked deeds. You better watch yourself. Stay away from that junk. So he talks about Noah. And in Matthew chapter 12, he says, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 12. He puts a stamp of approval upon that. What about Daniel? They said, well, Daniel, he didn't really live, and that really didn't happen. Well, he put a stamp of approval on it. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15? When ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That God, Christ told it, he who was a prophet. Stand in the Holy Spirit. He said, when you see that, that's when you're supposed to flee out of Jerusalem. I believe that day's coming pretty, pretty soon. But anyway, as you go through and you read some of these things, I want your faith to be in the Word of God. I want you to trust the Scripture. If he's right on all these things, do you think he could be right if you will believe the Scriptures and the life that's in God's Word, the hope that it should give you, the peace of mind that you should have? I said some things in Sunday school this morning. I wish I could repeat them all again, but... I ain't got time to do all of that. But there's some good statements. Uh, one of them that I talked about was talking about how that he is able to, you know, uh, make everything abound toward us. And he is able to do all these wonderful things. But just because God is able to, you know, exceedingly great and wonderful, marvelous things toward us, doesn't mean he will. Just because God knows what you have need of before you ask doesn't mean you're going to get it. You see, he is able to supply all of your needs. But it doesn't mean he will. There's times when God's the one that decides what you need, not you. And then he says, for his honor and for his glory. So even though God, I know that he's real and he's powerful and he can do anything he wants to do. But he may choose not to do them. He can raise the dead. And he has power to steal the storms. But he may not steal the storms, but he has power to. I'm just supposed to live my life knowing that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But he may choose not to because he may have a higher purpose than you and I do not see and do not understand. But trust the Lord. Anyway, so much for the notes. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. You've probably never seen this before. I just invented it tonight. It's a new illustration. New illustration. This is you and me. And this is sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us. Isn't that the best news you've ever heard? God loves me. You know, one of the first songs I ever really remember, and I wasn't saved, was, Jesus loves me, this I know. Let's sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, he are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. 
Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. You know, all the little kids will always put the word for in there. For the Bible, you the Bible, no, for the Bible, they'll always all of you do that. So I started doing it because the kids do it. God loves us. Now, he hates our sin, but he loves us. That's one of the things I always keep pointing to. I want them to know God loves you. He doesn't like your sin, but he loves you. And he says that to pay for the sin is separation from God. We're all going to die. But to go to heaven, you have to be perfect, as righteous as God, and because of sin, will never be perfect. So God says you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven by your good deeds. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us, but he hates our sin because it separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. He took our sins, paid for them on the cross, came back from the dead. Said that if you and I, if we would believe he did it for us, he would put that payment on our account. We get to go to heaven on what he did for us. That's the best news in all the world. No tricks to that. Is the Bible true? I believe it's true. I believe the word of God is as true and as perfect as the Son, as the Father, as heaven itself. No sin, no faults. That's the way God intended it. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you right now in the quietness of this moment, just say something simple like this, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe that when Christ died, he died for me. And I'm going to trust him right now as my Savior. And friend, God said if you would trust him, he would save you, give you eternal life. You can know that you're going to heaven when you die. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I pray that each one of you here have trusted the Lord. But if there's anyone here tonight, and you've never done so, Maybe you've heard about it all your life, but you just never trust the Lord. Why not do that right now? You have no guarantee on life. But why not right now take advantage of this moment? Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, this moment. And if you will trust Christ as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and put it right back down. Is there anyone at all? Say, yes, pray for me. I will trust Christ as my Savior tonight. If you're watching by Internet... I pray that if you have understood what I've said, that you will accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you will, right on the screen, it says, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. And if you do, God says he saves you, gives you eternal life. You become his child. You get to go to heaven when you die. It's a gift. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thanks for giving us a good day, for blessing us. We thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy here.